Ahoy hoy! If this is your first time with us, welcome! And if you're joining us from a previous video, hey hey, we love to see it, and I hope you're doing well. It's season 10! The season that probably has that episode of King of the Hill you can't stand. Which episode? That fluctuates, but a good number of the episodes I see people talk about come from this season. So you know I gotta ask, what worked? What failed? What artistic clownery will be curtailed? Where have you been? It's time to review season 10. Hank and Bill get ditched by Dale and Boomhauer who go on their private fishing trip every year. However, this year Hank finds out they've been doing it and forces them to take Bill along and turns into a family trip, much to the chagrin of Dale and Boomhauer. And so, the whole family heads to the beach for a relaxing weekend and when Bill gets the ride in the A car, while Hank has to fall back into the B car, Hank finds out they weren't avoiding Bill, they were avoiding him. He was too strict and told them too much of what they could and couldn't do. They go off and have a great time while Hank feels dejected. Peggy and Bobby go metal detecting on the beach and fight for space with the local detectees, even having to fight dirty by the end. Hank decides to relax thanks to Peggy's advice and goes out on the boat with the gang and starts having a blast until they all jump off the boat and no one set up the ladder before doing it. The gang are now stranded and they reveal that the ride was chaos without Hank and that he's the tether that for better or worse, keeps them all alive. Thanks to Hank's quick thinking and Dale's emergency sig, they're able to get rescued and come home shaken, but okay. Not gonna think about the ship or them having to be rescued or anything, just happy they all walk into the sunset together. It's a contained episode that really only works as a later season episode. We have seen tons of examples of Hank acting like this throughout the series. The further into the series this episode is, the more effective it is, and I think it makes for an excellent season 10 premiere. Hank's on board is a high seas, nine out of 10. Oh look, it's the start of the Arlen Bystander arc. Peggy is a journalist for a little bit, that's, that's it. The Arlen Bystander is under new management and they've decided to fire their grown, uncomfortable, confrontational paper boys, more like paper men, for actual kids. Meanwhile, Peggy goes to interview with the Arlen Bystander for a role and ends up having to come up with down-home cleaning solutions. She and Min team up so Min extracts cleaning tips from Lauma, who is only on the phone and has no lines, and then gives them to Peggy in exchange for that day's crossword puzzle. When Min can't help her anymore, Peggy inadvertently writes a recipe for mustard gas and almost takes out the whole town. The B story has Dale begging Bobby to take over his paperboy route and he can sleep in the Winnebago while he does it. Bobby gets to wake up before the sun, get into a grown man's van and sleep while that grown man chucks papers and tears up people's lawns, offering van to door service. It's a uh, very weird, very dated episode. Go ahead, correct me. Tell me the last time you read a newspaper. That being said, it's weird, but it works. The Peggy and Dale stories are exactly what those characters would do, and having Min and Khan attached to the story actually gives it that extra depth. I didn't talk about it in Smoking and the Bandit, though I do encourage you to revisit that episode after watching this one, just so you can see what was supposed to happen. But Jenkins, everyone's favorite sassy one-eyed reporter, was actually played by the late Henry Gibson, who I gotta say makes a side character that will continue to pop up through the series, and is honestly one of the most positive additions to the later seasons. Like even after Peggy moves away from being a journalist, he's still around. He will be around until the final season if only in some appearances as he would pass in 2009. Beist and Me is a recipe for an 8 out of 10. Hank and the family fall horribly ill, and when they can't take care of themselves, Bill jumps into action to nurse the hills back to health. That's a really noble thing for him to do. Good on Bill for looking out. Bobby and Peggy make different promises to God if they make it through their illness. Peggy even swearing she'd learn how to ride a bike since she grew up riding horses. And when the family is all healed up, Bill tries to poison them to get to take care of them a little longer. There it is. There's the Bill ruining part of it. Hank miraculously isn't kicking Bill out of their house and banning him from ever coming near his family again, but instead he's helping him channel his caring nature into helping run a halfway house out of his own home. We get the return of Appleseed who tells us he is in fact an alcoholic. Bill burns himself out caring for other people and Hank has to fix the problem. You've seen it before. 
Bill's house is the most Bill episode to ever focus on Bill, and you're either going to love or hate it. Personally, I think the jokes keep the episode up, and the Peggy Bobby B story at least helps the episode along. We keep getting these cuts to her not being able to swim or ride a bike, and it just it's a sweet moment between her and Bobby. The leader of the halfway home group is a perfectly slimy person to hate, I just kinda wish it was a special guest star instead of just David Herman again. He's not a bad actor by any means, and he plays his characters well, I've just heard that Draper voice so many times. It's the exact same one from the Timeshare episode or in Redcorn Gambles with his future, which just had that with a little bit more of a Yiddish touch. It feels more like a placeholder than anything, like they were going to put something else there. I don't know, the episode just feels samey and bland in a lot of parts. It's a perfectly okay 7 out of 10 that is really hoisted up by the jokes. If the writing didn't feel as fresh as it did, it'd be just a slog. Instead, it at least feels more lighthearted and plays off of itself well. When Hank finds out his beloved Tea Kettle Rock formation has been defaced, he goes to the city manager to get it cleaned up. Vance Gilbert, the city manager, is actually played by voice and screen legend Gary Cole, who you'd recognize from everything from Office Space to Family Guy. He's Birdman, attorney at law. He's in the Brady Bunch movie. You know him, you love him, he's an icon of comedy. Peggy begins to do a deep dive into the history of the tea kettle to find a reason for it to get cleaned up, and actually discovers that Arlen was founded by women and was known as Harlan. Well, it goes deeper. Turns out these women were professionals of their trade and were two outstandingly talented madams that put Harlan or Harlot Town on the map. Hank tells Peggy she can't share this history, but she's duty bound by her journalistic integrity to tell the whole truth, which is honestly pretty respectable. She puts out the article and people are intrigued. It even gets the city manager to call them to his office and he wants to clean the tea kettle and open a heritage museum, which Hank is completely opposed to. He tries to petition while the rest of the city celebrates this dug up part of their history. Then Vance goes behind Peggy's back and announces that the Texas Adult Film Awards will be held in Arlen and there will be a whole museum of prostitution now. Again, it's overstepping what should make sense. Hank helping two adult film stars including Candy played by Shannon Elizabeth and they get this big change of heart and convince all the other adult entertainers to leave Arlen? Sure, fine, yeah. I. I guess. Honestly, the whole rediscovered history of Arlen is kind of swept under the rug by the second half, and it's like they're trying to rectify a completely different thing. Yes, Hank brings up that the city was founded by women, but it never goes further than that. It never comes back to that. It just sort of drones on. Like, at its core, their initial plan was solid. A heritage museum and a kind of racy backstory to the town could draw much needed tourism. Remember Hank's cowboy movie? He should have been all on board if he really cared about Arlen. Instead, he goes back to his sensibilities and it's just weird and kind of out of character. He makes a lot of odd calls this season and not a ton I agree with. Also, what award show is willing to be held in a pork processing town? It wants you in shock and laughing so you don't ask questions about how they get from point A to point B. The first half of the episode is really solid and shows Peggy at her best. The second half feels completely disjointed and like a radical jump needed to justify Hank being upset. Harlottown is a leg lifting 7 out of 10. The B story? The neighborhood plays kickball in the street and while Dale was picked last, it's actually John Redcorn that is just the absolute worst player. Alright cool, that's out of the way. The A story? Bobby is goofing around and experimenting with prop comedy at school and church, much to Hank's embarrassment. Hank, determined to put an end to this, signs Bobby up for a community college course about learning to be a clown. Professor Twilly, the avant-garde master of the craft of Comedia de Art, is played by comedy legend Paul F. Tompkins, aka Mr. Peanut Butter from Bojack Horseman, an iconic voice playing a less than iconic character. Yeah, Bobby goes from just being a lovable class clown to learning about the nuance to the he, the ha, and the ha ha. It's a lot like media studies. You learn all the different elements of media criticism so that you can look at different artifacts under an assortment of lenses. But if you stop halfway through your studies, you end up with Wes Anderson as your favorite director, and you're begging for a chance to talk about how he's inspired by the classic German filmmaker Ernst Lubitsch. Professor Twilly is someone so self-absorbed and uses their craft as a means of acting superior to everyone else. This was written by someone that had a media criticism professor they hated. 
it's too specific and too accurate for that to not be the case. On the plus side, Bobby learns about the deeper levels of comedy and joke delivery. He just learns it from a guy who doesn't play his audience. Bobby's character is Tartuffe, the spry wonder dog, which seems very inspired by Doggy back in Dances with Dogs and just, yeah. Hank sees his son about to make a fool of himself on stage and begs him to use his props instead of the clownery shenaniganery, and the episode ends. I like the kickball parts, and Paul F. Tompkins brings it 10,000%. It just reminds you of Bobby's comedic roots and you want to see it actually reinforced so bad. I don't know, I really want to love this season, I do, but there's some struggle bus episodes coming up. A portrait of the artist as a young clown is a hee-hawed 6 out of 10. Khan gets invited to Ted's house and he falls in love with his pool and Ted introduces him to Ngak Fong, a legendary Laotian guerrilla fighter, and they judge Khan for forgetting his Laotian heritage. Khan just really wants a pool, he doesn't really care. He, he looks out that pool and he's like, man, that is the American dream right there, I want a pool. Hank and the gang offer to build it for him if they get to use the pool from time to time. I really love how the gang comes together and they just, yeah, they just build a pool. That's terrific. All of that is great. Ted then pressures Khan into being a better Laotian, and so he decides to uproot all of his Western ways and try and live like a true Laotian should, even offering to sign up for the guerrilla fighter training, even though he's, you know, a soft and squishy computer developer. Meanwhile, you keep seeing Ted in a giant mansion driving imported cars and proud of his giant pool. He guilts Khan because he knows Khan can be guilted. I really like that Khan does try and encourage Connie to embrace the roots, but you can see it's a struggle for the whole house. Ted is just a miserable antagonist that exists to put Khan down, but it works. Because every time you see the businessmen of the town, there's Ted. Ted is so ingrained in Arlen that he is such a perfect antagonist. The episode does a great job of humanizing Khan and really showing he just wants to be happy. He just wants to raise his family in peace. Even by the end, he tells Ted that he's just going to live his life while Bobby saves Bill from choking yet again. The episode has a lot of solid, wholesome moments and is honestly probably one of the strongest con episodes of the entire series. He and men are handled incredibly well and it just works for their characters. I appreciate what the episode is doing and honestly, it's one of the star episodes of the season. Orange You Said I Did Say Banana is a deep end diving 8 out of 10. Hank has managed to lead his baseball team, the Zephyrs, to an undefeated season where they speak at Tom Landry Middle School and find out that the school had to take away the baseball team due to funding, and so Hank is determined to get it back. He finds out about the ace and his diamonds who will do a bunch of wacky plays, and then when they beat the other team, they turn around and give the money to the charity they were playing for anyway, because they're just that nice. The ace is played by John Schneider, who's probably most famous for playing Bo Duke in the Dukes of Hazard. but fun fact, he was also the runner-up in season 10 of The Masked Singer as The Donut. Don't Google anything else about him, but that's, that's wild, that's interesting. Anyway, Hank decides that he's gonna beat the ace and give him a game he never saw coming. That's right, Hank wants to effectively beat the Harlem Globetrotter squad of baseball with a tight control game of bunts and walks. He, uh, he doesn't get the joke. He doesn't put one and one together. He would be a nightmare at any wrestling show. The team practices, and on the night of the event, they try to play for real, understandably, to the ace's disappointment, and he decides to play for real, blowing them out of the water and humiliating them in front of the entire stadium before taking the check and walking off. They didn't play by the rules. Hank and the gang go to apologize to him and ask him to give them another chance where they'll let him get whatever plays he wants off of them, and when he refuses, they start to tip his trailer over and threaten to do it in every city he visits until he pays them. Hank does a wacky little shakedown. Like, the episode doesn't end with them laughing and getting into little goof plays and tee-hee, oh, what a wacky little adventure. It ends with the ace giving Hank the check so they'll leave him alone and reinstating the baseball team. I... yeah... There's no message, there's no proper conclusion, just we'll harass you till you pay us. Regardless of how the ace acted, like he was justifiably upset. I don't know, this is an episode where they had like one joke that they wanted to do and didn't have a way to resolve it. If this was an earlier season, I'd say this was the most Mike Judge thing ever. 
calm and collected Hank just going, screw it, shake the trailer. But they don't even give us that manic energy. It's toothless yet aggressive. It's like getting bitten by a frog. It's not gonna do anything, but they're gonna do it. I love the episode. I just wish it had a better hook to hang the end of the episode on. You gotta believe in moderation is a walk-worthy 7 out of 10. It's career fair time, and Bobby doesn't want to work at Strickland, instead wants to see what else is available. Joseph signs up for the Strickland work-study, which drives Hank insane. Bobby runs into an entrepreneur who is more than happy to take him under his wing in the fast-paced, exciting world of domestic waste removal. Peter Sterling would actually be played by Johnny Knoxville. We forget that Johnny Knoxville is an actual actor, and if you've heard his voice work, he's actually really solid. Man is multi-talented and multifaceted. You don't build an empire with your friends without some kind of that razzle-dazzle magic. He's an Agent Elvis, and he was a Ninja Turtle, so you know, the man stays busy. And yeah, no, Bobby works in waste removal to the disgust of Hank and Peggy, but he shows a real talent for it and desire to go out on his own. Peter works mostly with high-end clients, he answers a very real demand, and has all the proper tools for sanitation, and makes a mint. Like you'd think Hank would respect that kind of work ethic and be proud that Bobby is stepping out on his own to answer a need in his community. Instead, he thinks that Bobby isn't attractive enough to be able to pull off a career like that, and he has Peter pretend to get beaten up to deter Bobby from the job. He gets beaten up by Jimmy Wichard because David Herman needs to do Jimmy every season, otherwise he implodes like a collapsing star. I just, I'm so tired of Jimmy. He was, he was fine the first two times, and then they kept bringing him out. He's like, I like cans. I'm like, I don't care. I just, oh. Hank of the earlier seasons wouldn't have a problem with this, and it feels like such a non-issue. Have them run foul of a Buck scheme or something, where Buck is trying to monopolize on waste removal and they get into like a terrain war or something. There are so many ways you could have added conflict into the episode, and they chose the laziest option. This episode just doesn't make sense anymore, and it's definitely one of my least favorite of the season. Like this should be celebrated in Bobby, and instead, they just completely put him down. Business is picking up is a steaming 4 out of 10. Khan gets inspired by a late night get rich quick scheme and decides to invest in a turnkey operation. Hank and the gang hang out at the car wash where Boomhauer impresses the ladies with his wheels and Hank brings Buck along to try and help him get his groove back. However, Buck and Khan end up going into business together and Buck loans Hank to Khan to fix up the car wash and make some extra money off of it. Khan abuses Hank's dedicated work ethic and even tries to be his own get-rich-quick scheme hype beast in the form of Mr. Quarters. Look, unless you're wearing a suit made of question marks and teaching people how to save the most on their taxes, that ain't the move, Chief. You're doing it wrong. And so yeah, Khan pushes Hank to quit and Buck teaches him a thing or two about not abusing your golden goose. Like, it's great to see that Buck cares about Hank, but also he was willing to throw away his project at a moment's notice and lend his greatest worker to a car wash of a man he knows hates Hank. I it's just, I don't know. The buck thing just feels sort of manipulative the more you think on it. Orange You Sad is the better con episode, but I think it does focus on an important element of his character. It's great to see men be so supportive of Khan as well, but that's about where the positives end. The Year of Washing Dangerously is a fine background noise episode that is best watched late at night when you're slipping in and out of sleep. It has a satisfying payoff, but isn't something you need to dedicate your attention to. The Year of Washing Dangerously is a washed up 6 out of 10. Man, I hope you all are fans of the show American Chopper. American Chopper was a series in the 2000s that had a family building custom motorcycles, and it was pretty popular, even spawning more than its fair share of memes. It focused on Paul Tietel Sr. and his sons, Michael and Paul Jr., and sure enough, they all guest star in this episode and are the most interesting part of the whole thing. Buck is stuck in a gruesome price war with the other gas boys, and so he pays American Chopper to come to the propane expo and make the other gas giants jealous. Well, the American Chopper crew don't bring a bike and gets them all into a propane-fueled brawl. A legendary gaseous smackdown. Hank tries to get everyone to work together and end the harassment and inadvertently causes the gas boys to get into a wily case of price fixing. Now, all of the A story is just fine. 
Hank has to wear a wire and convince them to stop their price gouging before they get absolutely legally eviscerated, and they use the American Chopper guys to cause some wacky disturbance. It's, yeah, yeah, whatever, it's fine. But we get the return of Lucky for a proper B story, where Brownsville Station is doing a reunion tour, and he's going to be the first one in line to pick up the tickets. I have to believe Tom Petty was just genuinely a fan of Brownsville Station, especially with how much he talked about other bands he loved. It's just, it's such a wholesome little B story where they stake out this empty theater just waiting to get the tickets and then waiting in line where they're very obviously the first people to even know, let alone care. There's no conflict. There's nothing else. It's literally just them waiting for tickets. They don't have to fight a scalper or run into any hazards. They are literally just there to wait for the tickets. Honestly, this lucky story is such a breath of fresh air to the whole season. It really goes to show how genuine Tom Petty was when he played Lucky. There was a true love in his delivery that made him a much needed talent in the cast. I'll also say like I haven't touched on it this season, but Danny Trejo has been absolutely delivering as Enrique throughout the entire show, and it just needs to be celebrated how animated he can make his voice. It makes the episode a must watch. Hank fixes everything as a price gouge, nine out of 10, saved entirely by the delight of the B story. The Hills run late for church and lose their usual spot and get into a tiff with Reverend Stroop because she supported a new family in the church and doesn't believe in assigned seats. The Hills decide to try the new mega church because it has a ton of shops and opportunities after hopping around to the different churches their friends recommend. It's a weird little collection of cutaway gags. It's, it's odd and it definitely feels a little out of place, but the comedic timing is still there and some of them are legitimately funny. And so yeah, the Hills had to find their place in the new megachurch beast. The reverend of the megachurch is Reverend Neely, played by Antoine Patton, aka the rapper Big Boy, aka the other half of Outcast. Peggy starts to assist the church, and Hank and Bobby start getting involved in an almost constant deluge of megachurch activities. Naturally, Peggy annoys the reverend because that's just who she is. And after a midnight showing of the passion, they hobble home. Yeah, it all just kind of implodes from there. Hank runs home to avoid church and watch some football and finds God through everyone's favorite hero, Lucky. Lucky decides to take Hank to his place of worship and get absolutely ripped in the name of the good Lord. Hank denounces going to church and his family denounces him. After a talk with the good Reverend Neely, Hank gets a divine message and he goes back to Stroop and sends the Smiths over to the mega church while strong arming the Reverend into getting his assigned seats to the church, lest he sell more people on the beauty of the mega church. Again, like, Hank threatens the Reverend to get his spots. Who is this Hank Hill? Why is he jumping to this so quickly? I, I don't know. There's some solid writing to the episode, but man, oh manity, it is rough the more it drags on. It never truly finds its conclusion and just sort of steamrolls into it. Church hopping is a firmly devout 5 out of 10. Buck gets kicked out of Jug Store Cowboys, a gentleman's club, and his band, so he has to spend more time at work and less money at the club. However, he gets infatuated with the way the cashiers at the ice creamery down the way spruce up their sales and tries to incorporate it into how he runs Strickland. One of the cashiers is played by Justin Long, who would make recurring appearances throughout the show. Meanwhile, Peggy uses her press pass to get free stuff and tries to get Bobby grandfathered into the perks. And so yeah, Hank has to help Strickland propane get free of Buck so he has to fix things at Jug Store Cowboys and get the owner and Buck to make up. It's simple, but the jokes are solid and it at least feels like a familiar episode of King of the Hill. I honestly think it's one of the best Strickland A stories that involves everyone. Again, absolutely, Toby Huss as Joe Jack is great, but Danny Trejo is really bringing it as Enrique and it just works. And we can't, we cannot ignore Steven Root as Buck Strickland who just brings such an impassioned, wild man to life as only he can. We're also getting more of Donna having speaking lines, so that's fun. It's not like she'll trap everyone in MySpace or anything. 24-Hour Propane People is an episode you can predict at this point, and it doesn't do much of anything new, but that's honestly okay. It feels like one of the last solid gasps of the quality King of the Hill in this season. From here, it's a sharp decline to the season finale. I'm just, I'm just gonna be real with you. You gotta appreciate that an actual iota of care was put into this episode, and of all the episodes of the season, this is the one I ironically revisit the most. 
24-Hour Propane People is a solid gas of an 8 out of 10. Bobby wants designer jeans to impress Amy to go to a party. But when he goes to Hank and asks for 100 bucks for jeans, he gets shot down and told to get a job. Huh. Remember that high-paying job that Bobby was excited about that Hank sabotaged? You know, from just five episodes ago? The show doesn't. Hank tells Bobby that someone who makes his own money is his own man and can't be told what to do with his money. Huh. And so Bobby is determined to earn his jeans. He becomes a sign twirler to earn the jeans and gets bullied by the cool kids. Then they run into panhandlers, including Derek, played by Dax Shepard. Bobby then decides to be like the cool panhandlers and panhandle himself alongside Joseph as they try and learn the mystic arts of being so cool they just hand you the money. They get their groove on and are so cool and laid back everyone gawks and they... Yeah, they panhandle. Bobby buys dinner for his parents and Hank can't say how proud of him he truly is. And then he finds out about him begging and yanks him out of it and turns him around and has to give away all of his earnings, so Derek convinces him to give them all of his earnings. He gets a date and goes back to Derek to get it back, and Derek and the gang just walk off. Bobby goes back for another job and starts handing out vasectomy coupons to pay for his date while calling out the panhandlers for just pretending to need money, and yeah, the episode ends with Spongy getting his spot on the street back. I just... It's Hank telling Bobby to get a job and then dealing with the consequences. It just feels like an episode that if you marathon the season, when you get to business is picking up, it just looks like Hank shot himself in the foot. Bobby had a successful business where he would have been his own boss and had a mentor excited to teach him the ropes. They showed it could be highly lucrative and Hank scared him away from a perfectly good opportunity and now he's panhandling. I just, the episode isn't anything. It's just this fluff that doesn't even have solid jokes to carry you through. And the thing that bugs me the most is all the stuff with Lucky is canon. They keep adding to the canon. They keep adding, you know, Peggy is a journalist. That plays into Harlot Town. That's something from the previous season and this season. There are season-long narratives that are included, but then they'll also just forget episodes out of the blue for no good reason. It, there is no rhyme or reason to it, and that's why the Texas Panhandler is a begging 3 out of 10. Hey, hey, it's the episode no one wants to watch. The Hills get new neighbors in Jim and Lila. Jim, played by frequent star of the show Scott Clace, and Lila, played by special guest Ricky Lake. The two also have a son, Caleb, played by Kyle Butcher, who has shown up in previous episodes. Caleb is 10, and just a horribly selfish kid that starts to harass the family. Meanwhile, Dale has to store his animal corpses in the fridge until he can dispose of them in bulk and discovers the wild world of taxidermy. Peggy is intrigued by Dale's work and wants to join in and compete with her storytelling prowess. Caleb pops up and starts ruining Hank's garage and tormenting him. Hank, now labeled Dusty Old Bones, has a bully. Say it with me, gang, everyone's favorite line. Dusty Old Bones, full of green dust. Such a powerful insult. It spans generations. It lives timelessly in your head. You know, I would go down to the schoolyard and call all the bullies Dusty Old Bones and talk about how they were full of green dust. Everyone, everyone says this line. And yeah. The parents tell Hank to just ignore him and let their little genius figure things out. When Caleb pushes Hank too far, however, Hank takes his bike and tells him he can earn it back if he shows some respect and the parents decide to, you know, call the cops on Hank, who everyone in the neighborhood proceeds to judge. Just like Miss Wakefield. Again, Hank has done everything to try and be controlled and mature in this situation. Hank then turns to Bobby to help him fight Caleb. Bobby then starts harassing Jim and Lila like Caleb did to Hank, giving the parents a taste of their own medicine. He starts to harass them until they finally stand up to their son. Dale and Peggy make a squirrel-shaped signing of the Declaration of Independence that proceeds to catch fire when plugged in. Ugh. Hank's bully is a concept stretched way too thin just for the sake of padding. I wish the B story was interesting enough to make the episode worth watching, but it just doesn't have any payoff. Peggy joins Dale in pursuing taxidermy and they fail. End of story. 
give them a win. Show that their creativity earned them something, and then you have Dale plug it in and it smolders. It trips over itself right at the last possible punchline and falls on its own knuckles and gets a black eye. Hank's Bully is a nothing episode that doesn't showcase the actors, doesn't have really any jokes to hold the episode on, and has Hank doing his third shakedown of the season. He's more like Tony Soprano at this point than he is Hank Hill. He is the Hank that knocks. He truly is the Mac Daddy of Heimlich County, a Heimlich Heisenberg. He has Bobby hold the parents at squirt point to fix his problem. Another shakedown. I just, this isn't it. Hank's bully is a dusty two out of 10. And here we are, the season finale. Oh, and it's a lucky episode. That means, legally, it has to be good. Peggy still hates Lucky, and he shows off his coat of honor by giving Hank back the shaving cream he borrowed. Bobby loves Lucky, Luann loves him, and he's a devout fan of the Game Show Network. He could be a lot worse, but it's understandable why Peggy hates him. She wants Luann to better herself and move away from the trailer park lifestyle. However, when Lucky approaches Peggy to teach him to earn his GED, she tries to blow him off until Hank convinces her to at least help. And to his credit, Lucky actually did his homework early to get ahead. Lucky follows his code, and no matter what, even if it's detrimental, he's going to stick to it. He tells Peggy that if he gets his GED, he's going to ask Luann to marry him. Peggy spirals when she sees Luann enthusiastically polishing Lucky's truck and decides to completely sabotage Lucky's education an affront to everything she stood for as a teacher. She didn't give up on the flying Hawaiian when he gave her time after time. Here, Lucky is actually applying himself and she decides to actively sabotage him to give him intentionally wrong answers. He's been a completely trusting student and she completely abuses it. Jimmy Witchard shows up at the test. Yay, woohoo. Sure enough, Lucky fails because of course he did and he can't marry Luann now, who reveals that she's pregnant. They both crumble at the revelation and Peggy actually feels some amount of guilt. She even later tells Lucky she sabotaged him and that she doesn't have a code of honor. I, okay, here's where, here's where you, you had a resolution and you go way off the line. Lucky reveals his ancestors all had shotgun weddings, so Hank has to hold a shotgun while he proposes to Luann to make it work. Like, there's no consequences for Peggy at all. She gets away with jeopardizing his future and betraying his trust. Instead of just helping him get his GED, she sets up a shotgun wedding. He could have just retested. You can do that. It could have actually been a real moment of reconciliation between the two, but nope. It's just point and laugh at Lucky's weird code. There's no B story. There's nothing to distract from it either. It's just a raise to the bottom and to get to the credits. The only resolution is Lucky gets engaged to Luann, who's pregnant. That's it. There could have been more, but there wasn't. Every time I look at the episode, I think of what could have been. Tom Petty works his hardest with Lucky this episode, and it's just for the sake of nothing. Educating Lucky is one of the worst season finales and one of the lowest points Peggy has ever reached. It's an understudied three out of 10. And there we have it, that's season 10. Anything you think I was right on, wrong on? What was your least favorite episode? Most favorite? Let me know in the comments below. And if you liked what you saw, make sure to like, subscribe, and tell your friends we're out here. Season 10 was a lot of things, but confusing would probably be the best way to describe it. It set up some things as a new canon and completely ignores others. It's the last we really see of Luann's growth as a character before the next season, and while there were some okay episodes, this season really did have some of the worst the show has to offer. That being said, we only have three more seasons to go, and man, what a batch of episodes they are. Season 11 would be the shortest season of the show and even had a potential series finale in it. We'll get some big guest stars, some returning greats, and Hank gets into those pesky video games. There's a lot to delve in when we cover season 11. Stay strong, keep fighting, and know that things will get better. I believe in you, and you got this. And I'll see you next time.